Welcome to this Patient Empowerment Network program. I'm Andrew Shore from Patient Power. I'm joining you from near San Diego, Carlsbad, California. And I'm so excited about this program. Does the clinical trial process need an extreme makeover? Having been in a clinical trial, and I'll talk about my experience uh, in a little while, I'm a big fan, but I know that people have concerns. And I know that the percentage of cancer patients who are in clinical trials among adults is very low. How does that affect drug development and having the chance to get closer to cures for us? I want to thank the financial sponsors uh, for this program who provided assistance to the Patient Empowerment Network. They are Celgene Corporation, Estellus, and Novartis. They have no editorial control. So what happens in the next hour is what we say, the questions you ask, what we hear from our experts who are joining us. If you have a question, send it in to questions at patientpower.info. Again, if you have a question, send it in to questions at patientpower.info. And our wonderful producer tomorrow will take a look at it, forward it to me, and as we can over the next hour, we'll be discussing questions you've already sent in. We'll have a very uh, inspiring, I think, and provocative dialogue between our experts. So let's meet them. I want to take you to Grand Island, Nebraska, where my dear friend Jim O'Mell is there. He's a retired now family practice physician. And Jim, for years, you've been a myeloma patient. When were you di diagnosed with myeloma and What's happened along the way? You're taking regular treatment now, I think, some treatment for uh, the bone complications. How are you doing and when were you diagnosed? Andrew, I was diagnosed in 1997. It started off with a plasma cytoma at T10. I broke my back. I underwent a stem cell transplant in 2000 and had six years of uh, remission. It came back in 2006 and I had radiation and Revlimid and it went away a while, came back again in 2010, and I had radiation, Belcade, Revlimid, Dex, and it went into remission. And since then, Andrew, I've been so fortunate that all I've been taking is bone, soft, bone protective bisphosphonates. Well, good for you. Now, you were in a trial, but you decided not to continue, but yet you're a believer in trials. Oh, absolutely. Without trials, our treatment wouldn't change. When I had a full evaluation at Arkansas, they suggested that I join their trial, and I did. And at the end of that trial was a tandem transplant. And I got to thinking and reading, and I didn't really want to get that extent of treatment. I had a single transplant, and I dropped out of the trial. And that's one of the things that I would certainly tell our listeners, that they can stop a trial at any time. They're not bound to it. Ever since then, Andrew, I've had the good fortune of having fairly responsive myeloma. And when I had my treatments, they responded to standard therapy. I certainly would have rejoined another trial if necessary, but I was fortunate that uh, it responded the way it did. Okay, and uh, before we meet our next guest, I just wanted you to list some of the committees you're on because you're very active uh, locally and nationally uh, on behalf of patients. So what are some of those activities you're doing? Well, I've been doing this since about 2000. So that involves a lot of activity. Uh, peer review with the NCI was one of my main ways to get started. National Cancer uh, Institute. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that progressed on to the Board of Scientific Advisors, which was a really good, uh, important work with the uh, director of the NCI. I've been an FDA patient representative for many years and was on the advisory board that brought Kiprolis or Carfilzomib to us. Um, I spend a lot of time each month for sure with the Alliance Cooperative Group working with Paul Richardson as we bring new trials to patients. I've been with CIBMTR Center for International Bone and Marrow Transplant research for several years, uh, several advisory boards. I'm on two pharma company advisory boards as they seek patient input. Wow. All right. Well, the point of this, what I wanted our uh, viewers to get is that Jim is a trained as a physician, worked many years as a family physician, became a patient, eventually had to retire, has been through a lot of treatment, and is very much a 
advocate for all of us, particularly in this process of trials. So we're going to talk about the unvarnished truth about trials and see how we can make it better. Okay, let's skip over to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we're joined by Dr. Mike Thompson, who is very involved in research. And Mike has been very involved in all sorts of uh, programs related to education. So Mike, first of all, welcome to the program and tell us a little bit about your involvement both locally in research and in education of other physicians uh, nationwide and worldwide. Sure, so uh, you know, I'm as impressive as Jim, but uh, he's one of my heroes who uh, has really dedicated to himself to uh, improving the clinical trials process. Uh, I uh, have an MD, PhD, my PhD is in pharmacology, and I was interested in pharmacogenetics and how individuals vary in their response to drugs, especially cancer drugs. Uh, I did my fellowship at MD Anderson and worked with a lot of myeloma doctors there and um, have worked in the community setting uh, seven years in one place and about five years now where I'm located at uh, Advocate Aurora Healthcare in Milwaukee. I have uh, been on the NCI Myeloma Steering Committee. I'm currently on the NCI Lymphoma Steering Committee. I helped organize the ASCO 2016 meeting. I was the chair of education. Uh, as of June, uh, I'm the uh, uh, one of the editors for cancer.net around myeloma, so taking over from Paul Richardson, who did that. Uh, so I'll be three years doing that and probably asking people like Jim for help to uh, uh, provide educational materials for people. Um, and in the world of myeloma, I've um, uh, created the MMSM, or Multiple Myeloma Social Media Hashtag, to have Twitter chats, uh, which I know some people don't think are the optimal form of communication, but it is a way to get uh, information out from experts and some opportunity for patients to ask questions. And uh, so I've been highly involved in social media, highly involved in the NCI and NCORP for increasing access to clinical trials in the community. Uh, and right now I am in the middle of uh, a NCI uh, designated a clinical trial called EAA172, for multiple myeloma, which has gone through the ECOG Exec Committee, the NCI Myeloma Steering Committee, and now we're um, discussing with uh, the companies and with um, CTEP how to bring that forward. And I think that's one of the things is how how much effort it takes to bring some of these trials uh, from concept to uh, activation. Okay. Now we've mentioned this uh, more rare cancer, multiple myeloma, not rare if you have it, but Jim has it. Uh, Mike specializes in a lot, but what we're talking about applies to the clinical trial process broadly. So we may have people with us living with lung cancer and hoping to live longer and live better, prostate cancer, chronic lymphocytic leukemia like me, or also myelofibrosis, I'm a twofer, if you will. There may be many different cancers uh, among our audience, and the process applies to all. So we're going to talk about that. So whatever it is, Ask your questions, questions at patientpower.info. I'm just going to uh, share a, a little personal story for a second because I'm very passionate about it and I wanted to mention it. And this is part of our Clinical Trials Mythbusters series. And we have previous programs on patient power with lung cancer experts, experts in other conditions about the clinical trial process. So look that up on patientpower.info. And there will be a replay of today's program and also a downloadable guide with highlights that you can share, talk about it with your doctor, with other patients, with people you know, and for your review. Okay, so now uh, my own story. In I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, the most common adult leukemia in 1996, terrified, had no idea what it was, didn't know anything about what a trial was, didn't know what the treatments were, quite frankly, thought I'd be dead like within a week. I didn't know. And so you start getting educated, and eventually that led to me connecting with academic medicine specialists, and ultimately suggestion at the appropriate time of being in a phase two clinical trial. I didn't know what the phases were. We may talk about that along the way. And it was 2,000 miles from my house. So I traveled a number of times to be in that trial, and I had my local oncologist collaborating in that. And the end result was I had a 17-year remission 
I had treatment again for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It wasn't until last year, 17 years. And I got the combination of medicines 10 years before that combination was approved. So I'm a believer. The second thing I'd say about trials was I was in a second trial along the way when I had deep vein thrombosis blockages in the veins of my legs for a blood thinner trial. And by being observed in that trial, that led to them discovering a second cancer, which was at work related to those clots, mm. myelofibrosis, and I was observed. So I liked the attention. It had nothing to do with what they were testing, it had to do with the observation you get. So again, I love the attention of being in a trial. It may give you access to tomorrow's medicine today, but there are things that may be broken. So Jim, let's start with that. Uh, Jim, what has been some of the frustration points for you relay the, the way the process has been today? Well, I think one of the main things, Andrew, is that clinical trials tend to be designed to answer scientific questions. I think what they should do is be patient friendly. I think they should be designed to help patients. If you ask any researcher, what is the purpose of a scientific trial? clinical trial, they will say to answer a question. If you ask a patient, they'll think the purpose of the trial is to help patients. The, it may seem like a, a minor point, but it's, it's not. Uh, patients need to be the center of them. We need to help patients understand what their contribution is to a trial. For instance, hardly ever does a patient hear how their outcome, what they did uh, during the trial, improved the, the final outcome of the trial. The, the, the patient needs to be centered. If we get to the trial to a point where some of the questions are pretty obviously answered, rather than continuing to accrue patients just to be statistically valid, I think trials should close sooner. I think they should be more focused on getting patient care without necessarily the scientific question. I'm not a radical. I'm certainly a, a fan of trials. We wouldn't be where we're at without trials, but I think they should just become more patient-centered and more patient-friendly. Okay. Now, Mike, Dr. Thompson, so we know we can't have new drugs approved by the FDA unless there are trials. Phase one, phase two, for sure, and often typically phase three, and sometimes even monitoring after a drug's been approved. I think you call those phase four trials. Um, but from where you sit, having been around this a long time, what are some of your frustrations? What would you like to see be improved? So, I mean, I, I agree a lot with Jim. I mean, uh, I think another word to put it on is pragmatic trials. So uh, I've been on a number of advisory committees, the NCI, um, investigator-initiated studies and pharma-directed studies. And uh, when you have an advisory group with a bunch of academics, they often think about the theories and they think about what would be interesting to know. And uh, increasingly, both the NCI and others are getting not only patients, but community physicians who will say, you know, we don't really care about this question you're asking. And um, we don't think that it'll fly, it won't accrue. And we know a lot of trials don't complete accrual, so therefore patients are wasted, if you will, because we won't have the information, we won't be able to answer questions. So uh, I agree, we, th there are so many things to get involved, it's hard to break them all down, but um, part of the issue is answering a clinically meaningful question. I think uh, the meaning should be patient-centered. Uh, within those questions, you can ask scientific questions that are embedded in what are sometimes called secondary endpoints or correlative studies. But uh, I, I just last week was talking to some pharmaceutical leaders and I said, you have to um, design a trial to answer a question people care about. And that's patients and the physicians because sometimes the trials are designed to get FDA approval and their comparator arm, if it's a randomized study, is uh, an arm that we don't think is the current standard of care and they have to do them in countries where um, they don't have as many therapies and they don't have as much access, so they'll get them done. But then when they're approved in the U.S., we don't know what to do with the trial because it's not a question we're asking. So uh, that's important. And I, I think if more studies are done not to get FDA approval, but to, to go on pathways and to ask what are the clinical branch points for decision-making, I think that's when you start getting good uh, trials. 
There are a number of other issues around um, the pragmatics. So there's this NCI match study, tons of people screen, very few people on the match drugs. And um, they switched over to a, a strategy more like ASCO taper where they waited for people that already had testing. And then the people that had already kind of pre-screened could get evaluated for the study. And many, many more people went on study. The uh, imaging and, and other things in the middle were not um, as rigorous as a usual clinical trial. And it rolled quickly. And I think the point is you're looking for big endpoints where you have to still kind of go back to the classical randomized phase three large study is when you're trying to make incremental improvements. So for instance, breast cancer, where the, the cure rate or progression free survival rate may be in the 90 some percentile rate or even CML or other things where we're doing so well, you need a lot of patients and probably a standard design. But in many other areas, you can do a variety of different techniques, uh, Bayesian analysis, continuous reassessment models, and one thing Jim mentioned was stopping for futility or if there's an obvious benefit. And that is done, but you know, probably not as often as it should be. And uh, the designs using uh, what are called interim analyses or futility analysis with data safety monitoring boards or DSMBs probably could be more robust. There could be more of them. And I think people are afraid to do them because they do slow the trial down, they slow accrual. And that has to do with stuff both within the trial as well as extrinsic to it. So there are a number of barriers and issues, but I think Jim's, you know, pinpointed a number of them. Okay. Well, folks, you can tell that uh, Dr. Thompson is a scientist. We're going to unpack this and get down to the nitty gritty. So, okay. So, Jim, uh, so first of all, we mentioned this term randomization. So people wonder in cancer, am I going to get the good stuff? I know that I'm sick. Maybe like in your area, multiple myeloma, there have been lots of new medicines, but in some other areas not, like pancreatic cancer, for example. So say, I understand the standard therapy and you're testing it maybe against that, but I want to get the good stuff because I'm really hopeful. I want to be a believer. So could you just describe where we are with randomization? Because that's a concern people have. Absolutely, Rand, uh, Andrew, and thanks for asking that question. That's a real red, red hot button item for me. I maintain that if a patient has gone to the effort of studying their cancer, studying the possible treatments, and they've learned of a trial that's open that they would uh, qualify for, they're excited, they go talk to the principal investigator, and they say, I want to be in this trial. And the PI turns to them and says, well, we'll flip a coin. You may get the uh, medicine we're going to be uh, using, or you may get standard therapy. Just imagine how disappointing that would be. And when it comes to randomization, um, Andrew, there's many, there are many trials that absolutely lack equipoise. And I'm afraid that uh, scientists often use equipoise. Tell us as, what that means. You better define that for us. Equipoise basically means equal um, equal balance within the arms. In other words, technically, officially, the principal investigator doesn't know really which arm is best. And yet, look at it from a patient standpoint. Let me give you an example. There was a trial in which patients had the choice of three oral drugs in one arm versus a stem cell transplant in another arm. Now, think about that. Think of the insurance ramifications, think of the fact that it takes almost a year to really totally recover from a stem cell transplant versus taking three oral drugs. How can anyone say that there's equipoise in a trial like that? So how can you pattern your life with the flip of a coin or a computer randomizing you to one of those arms? Wow. That's, that's an important issue. Another one is, uh, Mike, you know, people, are, one of the ladies wrote in on Facebook, I posted about this program, and she said, well, the trials are not really accessible to me because I live in a rural area, and they're only in the big cities. You're in one, Milwaukee, but Jim's in Grand Island, Nebraska. I mean, in some people, if you set requirements for the trial, well, you got to come see me or come to the clinic for a variety of tests with some frequency, and somebody has to drive four or five hours and take off work and get babysitters and all that. It just makes it impractical. Where are we with 
more trials being available or having an aspect of it, like testing, closer to home? Yeah, so I work at a community setting. I'm at our kind of flagship hospital, but uh, we cover, you know, most of the population centers of Wisconsin. So I think we cover about 70 or 80 percent of the population. Uh, so that's a huge issue for our site is we, uh, when I talk to sponsors, including as recently as last week, I say, if we can't do it at all our sites, I'm not really interested in doing your trial. There are exceptions, of course, if you're doing you know, a surgical trial or a radiation trial that has to be at one site or sometimes a phase one trial with a lot of blood monitoring, very intensive. They, they can only be done at a few sites. But in general, I completely agree that we should try to have the drugs available uh, to people in the communities they live in because that's where their social networks are, right? So that's where their family is. They can stay at home. They don't have to go into a hotel. They don't have to pay for travel. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's better for everyone. And for companies, I've been trying to tell them that it's more generalizable to the reality of uh, where cancer patients are. So 85% of cancer patients are in the community setting and are treated there, and drugs should be accessible to them there. So, uh, you know, both the uh, using the CCOP uh, mechanism or NCCCP, and now we have the NCI Community Oncology Research Program or NCORP, the whole idea is to increase that access to community sites. And so this has been going on for a long time. I think there were budget cuts. And so um, the US and the way we've established our cancer budgets has been to decrease access from at least NCI trials. And usually you need some of those NCI trials to support the research infrastructure to do other studies. So I think part of that, you know, a lot of these things, you follow the money. And if there was more money for community research sites, you could hire more uh, research staff to get these things done. But uh, I think we need to get them done in the community because we know if you do early phase studies and they look promising and highly selected patients, then when you expand them and put them in the community, you go from efficacy to effectiveness, and the effectiveness isn't there because the patients are different. Um, so there's all these things with real world data and comparative effectiveness research and ASCO's cancer link, trying to get at some of that not on study to just try to get the data, but uh, we need to have access to people and the way to make drugs cheaper make them develop faster and answer more questions, both scientific and, and patient oriented is to get more people on trial. There's a big example for uh, immunotherapy drugs where there's so many immunotherapy drugs and trials, there are not enough patients to get it done. So we're going to be enrolling on trials which don't complete or uh, we're, we're not gonna be able to answer these questions. So it's gonna st stall and limit out uh, our process of moving faster. In myeloma, we've moved very fast, but we need to do this in other areas too. Right, so let's talk about that. So Jim, um, you know, the president had a big kickoff and HHS Secretary Azar, I think just yesterday as we do this program, was before Congress. And part of it was the discussion of, can we lower the cost of drugs ultimately? And one aspect of it is, can we speed drug development? So instead of all these um, trials languishing at the cost of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, how do we speed it up? So one is participation, certainly, but can the process be simplified as well, Jim? What work is going on there so we can try to get these answers and get to the FDA and present the data quicker and hopefully there's been lower cost in getting to that point. Well, as we're learning more and more about each individual patient, personalized medicine and uh, targeted therapy, we certainly should start relying more on biomarkers. Biomarkers can be a way to select patients that would particularly fit a given treatment. We, we need to lower costs. We need to make trials slicker and, and faster. Uh, single arm trials are those in which a patient just gets, all the patients get the therapy. They all get the same treatment. And FDA has actually approved drugs based on single arm trials, a much faster, more efficient way to get an answer. The, uh, the, the problem is that the costs are going to be there. 
when I think about Mike and all the work that he does in developing his Venita Clax trial that he mentioned, Mike has put in months or years, and it's all above and beyond his normal time. I mean, his day job is to take care of patients. So all of the work that he does to develop a trial is just remarkable in the extra hours it takes and the, the consistency that Mike gives to doing his work. We need to make the trials more efficient. We need to use biomarkers. We need to make them shorter. We need biostatisticians to come up with ways to give us an answer without having to accrue so many hundreds or thousands of patients to all of these potential uh, new treatments. So Mike, let's talk about that. And Mike, first of all, I wanna thank you for your, well, both of you, but Mike, certainly in the clinic, thanks for your devotion to this. But continuing on that, so, this was brought up by Jim, biomarkers, and I know in some of the blood cancers now, we're talking about more and more minimal residual disease testing. And we're doing genomic testing to see what genes have gone awry, what's our version of a lung cancer or a breast cancer or a myelofibrosis or whatever it is. And then do we qualify for a trial? What's our specific situation? Do you feel that that sort of precision medicine testing and analysis can help refine this. So we know which trial is right for which person at which time, and also some analysis along the way of how's it going. Yeah, so at, at my site, I'm the director for precision medicine, and I gave a talk at ASCO on precision medicine and barriers to the, in the community setting. So I'm very passionate about that. And I think that is one of the ways you can try to get things done with um, smaller numbers of patients and things done faster. And, you know, part of this is alignment, right? So there's different perspectives, a patient perspective, a payer perspective, a pharma sponsor perspective, the physician, there's, there's all these different perspectives. And I think it's trying to get them all aligned and try to get things done faster. So, you know, there are some areas where we don't know enough and we can't use biomarkers, but there are other areas where we um, have a biomarker and there's feasibility and we can test that quickly. And if we are looking for a large effect size, sorry, I'm in jargon mode, but if you're looking for a big, big hit, you know, a home run, uh, is to look for an alteration that you have is very um, specific and we think is uh, a drug can target, so-called targeted therapy. I, I, it's a little bit of a misnomer, but so in lung cancer has been one of the hottest places for this. So there's, you know, ALK inhibitors, ROS1 inhibitors, EGFR inhibitors, and now BRAF inhibitors, HER2 targets. So lung cancer has exploded with precision medicine therapy and same with melanoma and BRAF. So, you know, I think even skeptics will say you don't really need statistics if the prior therapies, nothing worked, and you give something to someone and 80% of people respond. Uh, there are issues with precision medicine is that the main thing is not response rate, but durability. And I think that's gonna be the next iteration of the NCI MATCH study, which is a, a large precision medicine study, is, is stop doing just these small groups of people where we're showing activity, but then they relapse quickly. And, and I think it's gonna look at systems analysis and how do we, overcome resistance, but one way to get at this, it's another different take on it, is inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this has to do with access and um, individualizing and being patient-centric. Many of the inclusion and exclusion criteria that when someone says, oh, I have lung cancer, oh, here's a lung cancer trial, and they say, oh, you, you can't go on the trial. And much of that is because there are there's language that was cut and pasted from a previous trial, which is not really pertinent. So if the new drug is metabolized by the kidney, uh, you don't necessarily need to look at the liver studies. And uh, we uh, did an inter, you know, we did a small study, uh, or, or I was aware of a small study done by Kaiser where if we improve the inclusion exclusion criteria, accrual rate could go up 30%. So no cost to that. Wow. And, uh, Ed Kim uh, led a publication of about six um, journal articles in JCO about different aspects of inclusion exclusion criteria including organ function hiv status age etc well we yeah we had ed kim on the program just a week ago as a matter of fact so jim inclusion exclusion so first of all we're in this age where of electronic medical records it would seem 
that um, at their fingertips, there could be some analysis of your record and some matching or offering of trials that could come out of an analysis of your results, genomic results, do you have ALK or ROS or whatever, if it's lung cancer, whatever it may be, me, JAK2 positive and myelofibrosis, what is a various status for us, and also broader inclusion criteria. And Mike was getting at that, saying some was just, exclusion was just cut and pasted. And a lot of us patients would feel, well, that's just unfair. So what's your comment on all that about inclusion, exclusion, and analysis so we can be matched with trials more easily can be offered to us? Inclusion and exclusion criteria are really important parts of trials. They're what get people into trials. They're what keep people from being in trials. And unfortunately, Andrew, many times the, the criteria are very defined, very narrowed, and drug companies especially want to do it this way to get the best effective uh, appearance of their drug. They want to get approval. And yet in the real world, many times, in fact most times, patients who would not even meet inclusion criteria are there the very patients that are going to be taking these drugs. And Mike's right, there's too much cut and paste. If a, a, a trial takes a thousand patients to write a, 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 a um, proposal or a protocol, too many times researchers will just take the exclusion criteria that might have been from a previous trial and as Mike says, cut and paste it when perhaps it's not even necessary to have uh, creatinine values or kidney values measured so precisely on this particular drug compared to the other one. So those are the criteria that let people in or keep people out of trials and they absolutely need to be widened to make a, tr to make a drug more applicable to the general population. We need to reflect the general population more in trials. Right. It's sort of a catch-22. So if somebody's at a drug company and they're investing hundreds of millions of dollars maybe to develop a drug, and then that trial is languishing or taking longer to get there, somebody ought to go back and say, well, can I loosen up this criteria, get the big answer, and uh, do benefit to patients who may be very willing to be in a trial if it doesn't have all of these requirements that are not really necessary, and we can get the answer and get it quicker and help people along the way. I mean, it's pretty obvious to me. I hope they're watching folks. So Mike, here's a question for you though, and you work with people in the community setting. So we have patients who've written in and said, you know what, where I go to the cancer clinic, they never mentioned trials to me. And Jim alluded to the extra time it may take for physicians and their teams when there are trials. You have just treating people with current therapies, and then you got research layered on top of that. It's time, it's very time consuming. So, but what about just awareness at the community level? What can we do about that? So that wherever I go into a clinic, they have a clear picture of what I'm dealing with. And if there is important research going on that relates to me, I hear about it. Now, maybe they say you gotta go to the university center, you gotta go to Milwaukee, wherever you have to go, but there's that discussion. Yeah, so with all these, you know, this has been analyzed in a, a, a multiple different papers. We were on one looking at a, a trial log, um, trying to look at some of these issues. And what seems to be clear is when people are offered trials, they tend to uh, go on them at about the same rate. And that has to do, um, seems to be somewhat independent of socioeconomic status, race, et cetera. Uh, or geographic area. So um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Varani, published about, about this about in rural settings, how you get people on trials. So th there are different barriers. So one is the trial. And like Jim said, if you can only do some therapy that you have to come in quite a bit for, that limits the geographic area you can accrue to for most people. Uh, there are site issues where if you don't have enough research staff to be there enough, the doctor doesn't feel supported to spend time on it. There's physician issues where um, they may not care about trials or they have too many people scheduled in clinic, they're an hour behind and they can't stop to spend time on it. Uh, also in the community setting, you may be seeing every type of cancer and you can't remember everything versus at many academic settings, you may only see one or you know a cluster of types of cancer. So if you're seeing lung cancer all day, 
and you have 10 trials open, you probably know those trials really well for lung cancer because you don't care about the CLL or myeloma trials. You only care about lung. Uh, and then there's patient factors. So the patients that are in rural Wisconsin may have different characteristics. And the reason they're in rural areas, you know, their motivations about, you know, uh, going in for things and stuff like that may be different than people that um, – have the capabilities to fly to Boston or Houston or New York, and they can do that. So all of those areas um, are important. Now, one potential way to help mitigate some of those things is, you know, we have got a clinical decision support tool, which is an IT product, which our physicians have to enter in what they're going to do with the patient. So it could be observe, no treatment, hospice, or various therapies. And when they put in the, the cancer in the stage, it pops up with the clinical trial is the first thing that pops up. And so the physician doesn't have to do the trial, but they have to say why they're not doing it. And so we can track over time. It doesn't necessarily help that individual patient, but that doctor is then aware of the trial. And we kind of get an idea of why people are not going on studies. Uh, and so that's one way to do it. Something we just did the last week is we had a different IT product where the NCI match precision medicine study opened up about five new arms with different targets for different drugs. So we looked back at the number of patients that had those targets identified within our entire system. And then we screened those to see how many people were still alive and were the, were, was their organ function still good enough to go on the, these trials because of the inclusion exclusion criteria. And we found several. So we're now going to contact those physicians and the research staff to go back for these patients that had screened for molecular testing and now they have new options. So I think there's um, IT issues that you can do systemically to try to take some of those barriers away. And then each of those points does have barriers which probably have different solutions and different ways of tackling. But one reason, you know, the accrual rate hasn't gone up for a lot is it's not easy. It's a complex problem. So th there's not going to be one single thing you do. There's going to be many different ways to um, try to improve things, All including right, so, patient education. Yep. Yeah, well, okay. So let's flip that over. Jim, you and I are patients. So what do we want to say, and from your perspective, so back at the clinic and in the group practice, so Mike is working on IT to identify trials and have it pop up on the, uh, you know, um, screen for the doctor. Okay, great. But we're the ones living with the condition. What can we do so that promising research that we may learn about is available to us, we can see whether it matches up with us. Maybe we have to go down the road. Maybe we have to have a discussion with our doctor to even encourage them to have us be in a trial. How do we make it happen, okay? Well, of course, we all need to educate ourselves about our cancer. When I was in med school, I had heard about myeloma, but I certainly wasn't any uh, expert in it. I had two patients in my practice that had myeloma. I knew sort of how to take care of them, but since I developed myeloma, I have become my own expert. And as I lead my support group, Andrew, I make them experts. I teach this cancer to them so that they can make educated decisions. Patients are very likely to go on, on the internet, watching patient power. In my particular cancer, they're going to go to the IMF and MMRF to look at myeloma trials and see what's available. And they will take that information to their doctors many times, making their doctor aware of trials that perhaps they aren't even um, uh, advocating or aware of. So Mike's right. There's, there's many factors that keep patients from trials. But one of the things that patients really do themselves is educate themselves and perhaps even to the extent of bringing or educating their doctor about what can be available for their treatment. Mike, I want to ask you about cost. Uh, so you mentioned different inclusion, exclusion, or what's your liver function or this or that. So um, there is a problem where maybe certain drugs or certain aspects of a trial are covered, but then your insurance company, you know, that you have or Medicare or whatever, may say, oh, no, we don't pay for that. But yet it's part of the trial or it goes along. So people have a concern about cost. I wanted to ask you about two aspects of cost related to testing sometimes and, uh, and then also 
are there programs that can assist with the logistical costs for patients as well? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I, uh, I trained at Mayo Clinic and MD Anderson, and when I got first into practice, I prided myself on not caring about costs. And then I realized, you know, you have to think about these things because you can bank, you know, we bankrupt about 40% of people with cancer get bankrupted. So these are huge issues um, uh, for people that want to keep their houses, that want to hand something down to their kids and, and, and cost is huge, right? So uh, that can either be throughout the whole course of standard treatment, or it can be trying to meet the costs of, of going to find places to find clinical trials. So uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, and various other national and state legislative initiatives have tried to make um, insurance companies pay for the standard costs in clinical trials. Uh, there are some carve outs for smaller companies and things like that. And so this is, you know, not perfect, but in general, insurance companies should pay for the standard costs of clinical trials. They should pay for standard imaging and stuff too when they try to get out of that. So um, it's not a perfect world, but that should be covered. And any research associated costs should be covered by uh, the company. And even in some NCI trials, some people disagree with what should be covered and isn't, and, and, and it's complicated. But in general, um, a patient, um, the research costs should be covered. Now, that does not include travel, lodging, um, and a lot of incidentals. So there are a variety of foundations that can be Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, that can be uh, other organizations which can help with that. The individual hospitals or health systems might have ways of approaching that. And uh, sometimes there are um, things you can do within the various companies. So there's a, a new target called NTRAC and the company LOXO, I've heard will fly people to wherever there's a site and pay for them uh, to go on the study, which I think is amazing. That's not true for every company and every uh, drug being developed, but that's one way to do it. One of the issues that comes up with IRBs, if you're giving people money, is are you coercing them? And you know, if you're just recovering the cost of travel, I don't think you are, right? But um, those are one of the things that come up. But uh, certainly, there are lots of disparities. And um, just, you know, just like in different countries, they don't even have access to the drugs. We have a standard drugs here. And uh, not all of these disparities um, are going to be fixed because we have, outside of cancer, we have lots of disparities in the United States. But um, cost is a big issue. And then uh, value, which we've increasingly been talking about in the oncology community, which is utility over cost. And uh, that's more of once we've done the trial and figuring out, even if it shows like it, wor it works, um, how do we figure out how to use it um, uh, based on those characteristics? Right, right. And also I wanted to mention that um, Mike Snyder had sent in that question answering about cost. So Mike, I hope that answers it. We have... Um, you know, some people wrote in as we were preparing for this program and they were bitter because they thought they had a spouse, let's say, that had died in a clinical trial. And that relates to a couple of things. One is transparency. Is the data from a trial and any dangers that show up, is that reported and analyzed in public, Jim? And also, um, what are the risks being in a trial and what is the monitoring to try to have trials be as safe as possible? So Jim, maybe you could talk about that from the patient perspective. I wanna make sure I know what I'm getting, I know what the risks are, and if any have come up along the way, I want it to be reported. And, um, and I wanna know that there's the team looking out for me. And you have every right to expect that, Andrew. If you're in a trial, you have the right to get that knowledge if there's new things that come up that we learn about. And part of the, part of every trial, as it's being written, there has to be a data safety monitoring board. These are the experts who will do what you've asked uh, be done. They will monitor the trial as it goes along. They will look for any safety issues. If there are patients that are developing liver toxicities, they will find this, they will, they will point this out and perhaps see if the trial needs to continue or if something needs to be revised. The presence of institutional review boards uh, review whether trials should go forward or not. Trial, patients who are in trials 
actually get very, very good medical care and medical coverage. In fact, I would maintain, Andrew, that they get better care than just standard care. They have experts that are watching them even more carefully than would be in a general routine uh, care setting because they're looking for these concerns and problems. The, the person who mentioned the bad outcome, we, we can't ever say that every trial is going to be perfect. There are going to be concerns. That's why trials are done. But they're relatively rare. And we do have boards and review organizations during the trial, not afterwards, but during the trial to be looking out for your benefit, Andrew, so that you're not uh, hurt by the trial. All right, but let's say this, and Mike, for you. So uh, first of all, admittedly, a lot of these trials start, people are sick people, and they're feeling maybe the trial is their last hope. Um, we had a friend, Lisa Minkov, who died in the CAR-T trial for CLL not long ago. She was, had been very sick with CLL. So we'd hope it would have worked. It didn't work for her, whether CL, CLL won. Um, and we know other people where, you know, the, as, as the learning is going on about often powerful new medicines, uh, they didn't benefit, or in one case, there was a drug, venetoclax, we know about. There were some deaths earlier on when the drug was far more powerful than was originally understood. So what do we do? I mean, that's the real world, I guess, of scientific study. But that's a concern, you know, Mike, of people saying, oh, my God, I'm worried about being a guinea pig or the unknowns. I'm subject to dangers. Yeah, so uh, there are a couple things. So whenever people say it, it doesn't come up as much recently, but about being a guinea pig, I say, well, guinea pigs don't have choices. So uh, and so like Jim has said, you know, you can drop off the trial if you want to drop off it. But um, so I, I think for adverse events and things that can happen, one reason to randomize people is uh, you do understand then if you treat someone with one thing and then another, and the death rate is the same in both, the drug's not causing it, that's just the disease. And uh, we, there a couple years ago, there was a presentation from the group at Dana-Farber on their precision medicine program. And the issue was they were taking so long to get people evaluated that, that their performance status or how well they felt uh, was good. And by the time they, get, they got through evaluation, many of them had died. Because the disease, you know, when you're getting to, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh line therapy can often progress very rapidly. And so I think that's one of the issues that people um, can feel the drug did it. And it's hard to know. And we get these doctors get these things called adverse event reporting forms. And we have to try to come up with is it probably related, possibly related. And we also get these forms that say, you know, you, you have a... Uh, uh, a patient on the study, the study's open in three countries, uh, thousands of people are on it, one person died of a heart attack. And you have no idea as the physician, well, is that the same rate as, you know, they're 70 years old, is that the same rate as this other 70 year old? Or So you, you need the numerator and the denominator, and that's what the DSMB or Data Safety Monitoring Board is supposed to do, which is look at the data and say, is this beyond what we would expect? And they can stop the trial, they can uh, do expanded cohorts. They can do things to try to figure that out. Now, we know from like even car companies lying about their exhaust systems that if the data safety monitoring board gets false data, well, it can't fix that. But that's pretty nefarious. Like that, uh, I think, is not something that's commonly happening and would be, you know, um, a very serious thing to happen. Now, one thing for transparency is that almost all studies I'm aware of get uh, registered on clinicaltrials.gov or maybe some other sites, but usually that site, and they're supposed to report out the outcomes. It's not also a perfect process, but um, you should be able to see how long the study's been open, are there any publications related to it, and those type of things. So uh, this whole process is not perfect, but I would say, in general, the people at the companies are trying to develop something they think is gonna work, they're trying to do it safely, both to help develop their drug well, uh, as well as to avoid a bunch of regulatory issues. Uh, and the people that are on the data safety monitoring boards are do, trying to do their best to answer these questions. But um, uh, the smaller the number of patients, which increasingly are the type of trials we are doing and almost are aiming for, is harder to be definitive about 
um, when these things happen, um, uh, what caused it. Right, right. It's imperfect, as we said. Jim, so um, Mike Thompson mentioned earlier, he gave lung cancer as an example, and of course, across immunotherapy. There are so many companies endeavoring to move this research along. So let's say you had lung cancer, or one of these others where this is big, although it's going on in the hematology area too. So a patient says, oh my God, there are all these trials and I might qualify for one, two, three, four. How do I prioritize? What do I bet on? You know, and maybe my own doctor is doing more than one. So what do you say to patients if they become receptive to being in a trial and there's more than one trial that they qualify for? That's a very good question, and it's a nice kind of problem to have, to have choices of trials. I think, Andrew, the best answer is a patient needs to look at what they are looking for. Are they looking for longevity? Are they looking for something that's going to extend their life? Are they looking for a trial that maybe will greatly improve their quality of life? Perhaps they might be in a trial that gives them one oral pill a week versus two injections a week. So there are certainly effectiveness endpoints. There are different things that patients find of value. But to answer your question, it really comes down to each patient needs to ask themselves, what is it that I'm looking for in a trial? Do I want something that makes my burden lighter? Do I want something that's going to extend my life? How much am I willing to accept as far as potential problems versus the standard of care or that I know what the, the problems exist with if I don't go on a trial? Right. And so that's a question we got in is trying to assess that. One was about how do I prioritize? The other is by being in a trial, Mike, is it going to make me sicker? Like, do I have to go through the valley of the shadow of death to get hopefully to a better place? And how do you discuss that with your doctor when not everything is known? Yeah, so I, maybe I'll kind of step back and say, you know, for phases of trials, phase one, the intent, uh, both ASCO and NCI say the intent of a phase one trial is therapeutic. But the statistical design is to evaluate safety. A phase two is to look at initial efficacy or how well it works. And phase three is to compare uh, versus standard of care, the efficacy. So there's other types of designs, phase zero, phase four, and other things. But um, it used to be, I think, you know, I, I we would say, you know, don't go into phase one unless, you know, that's the last option because you've already gone through the safety and initial efficacy if it's a phase three trial. Uh, it costs a lot of money to do phase three trials, so fewer are being done now. And we're kind of finding that in this era of precision medicine, people are going on trials uh, and, and there's no one rule, but um, I, uh, I look at it as if it's, if it's a, a study involving a lot of different groups of patients, a lot of, you know, it's not as individualized to you. I don't know, but I think it'll have less of a benefit probably than if it's something like uh, a study designed for BRAF melanoma back when that was a study and you have BRAF. Well, it's targeted towards you. It doesn't mean it'll work, but uh, even if it's an early phase, so phase one or two trial, uh, it's really aimed at your disease. And, you know, we're finding this with venetoclax with T1114, and there's other, you know, uh, markers, you know, FLT3 and AML, all these things. And sometimes we find that the drug doesn't work like we think it's going to work. The ALK and Ross story in lung cancer, it may benefit other people that we didn't recognize before. And that's part of we're trying to find people besides T1114 that respond to venetoclax and myeloma because it looks like, you know, some people will. Uh, but I think as we're getting more targeted therapy, it doesn't mean there's no toxicity, but it, it, it at least has the suggestion that we're targeting it more at your specific cancer. And some of these pills can have as much toxicity as IV chemos, but um, our, our aim is to decrease toxicity and increase efficacy and I think, like Jim said, you got to look at um, the different trials and hopefully with a physician who has time to sit down and run through several scenarios. And uh, some people will take the most aggressive therapy because um, 
that's what they're after. And some people will try something that's easier and it's closer to home. So everyone's values are a little bit different and you have to try to individualize it to the patient. Right. The other thing about trial matching is besides clinicaltrials.gov, there's myeloma and other groups that are doing these matching. So you can put in characteristics of your cancer and you can try to filter out and, and get a closer approximation, including in clinicaltrials.gov, you can uh, click on the states in the surrounding area or how many miles you're willing to travel. Right. I would mention, put in a plug for our advocacy group friends, whether it's Lung Cancer Alliance or Bonnie Adarian Lung Cancer or the International Myeloma Foundation with Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. You can be in touch with them directly and talk to them about your situation, and they will often be very aware of trials and how it's starting to line up with these subgroups, subtypes of the illness. Here's a question we got in with Jack. I just want to get in a couple more before we have to go. This relates to what you were talking about, about the National Cancer Institute's match trial, um, as I understand it, Mike. He said, regarding precision medicine, I thought I heard that initial results have been disappointing for the NCI's match trial, which treats patients with a specific mutation, with a specific drug for that mutation. How does this impact precision medicine? Do you want yeah. to talk about that? Yeah, so um, the uh, people that are uh, opponents of precision medicine uh, would say that uh, the SHIVA trial in, in Europe and the NCI match trial or failures, I, I think you need to look at it a little more carefully. And uh, if you do a huge you know, screening uh, and you don't have many drugs, you're not gonna have many matches and not many people are gonna benefit. So uh, there are some arms in match that matched and they accrued the number they wanted and the drugs didn't work well. So those were truly, you know, we think negative studies, but I think there is, the things about match are there's a huge interest in the community and they had thousands or several hundred people screened when they only had a few uh, arms open and those people weren't matches and it basically overwhelmed the system and then they had to rejigger it to open up more arms so uh, I, I think we could you know pick holes in the design of the initial study but I think it just took everyone by surprise how much interest there was in trying to personalize these molecular therapies and other iterations, such as ASCO Taper, there's company versions of it, like Novartis Signature, and I think the new design of Match uh, do allow for um, better match rates, and we'll see how, after they've adjusted, um, how well they can uh, uh, hit their targets. Okay, so that's an example where we're going through a makeover there. Um, before <laughs> we go, Jim, um, we have people watching from all over the world, and uh, Mike alluded to sometimes trials done in other countries. Certainly they are. So we have somebody from New Zealand. We have people from other countries now. They say, how do I access trials? Does it have to be in my country? Or what would you say to an international audience as far as finding out what's available to them? That's a difficult question because every country has their own standards. Each country has their own boards that review. Uh, what is allowed in some countries are not even allowed. Uh, observational trials can have more importance in some, in some countries than others. Again, it's a tough question. I think perhaps the person who asked it really needs to be, again, their own advocate and go online, go to their physician, go to their local support groups, go to their national groups, because they're the ones that can give that local person their answer. There's no one set answer for every country because there are so many variances. Right. I do, want, I do want to tell one of my favorite stories. I have a friend, Jan Rin, in Dublin, Ireland. She had a tremendous problem with more advanced chronic lymphocytic leukemia, one of the conditions I have. No trial for her there. She heard about Imbruvica being studied in Leeds, England, different health system, national health system. She was in Ireland, didn't have it. She got permission from the Irish government to go over to Leeds and be in Dr. Hillman's trial there. And I think it saved her life. She would tell you that. So she had to be pushy. There were newspaper articles. She had to do lots of things to make it happen. Um, it's going to be very by country. But it starts with a... Or the you know, Andrew, who know a good drug, 
uh, like the one you mentioned, and it's not available in the country. And there's so much of that in myeloma. We have many, many drugs in the U.S. that they don't have in other parts of the world. And it would be so sad to be a, a, a patient in those countries, know that a treatment like that's available, but not have access to it. So we all need to work to get these drugs available to patients wherever they're at. Amen. I want to just get some final comments. We may just go a couple of minutes over. So, Mike, the process is improving, I hope. You're working on it. Uh, can we feel confident that these gaps, if you will, improving it for precision medicine, more awareness among the doctors wherever we may go, financial assistance, working with the insurance companies, are you working on it so that this process we can have some improvement and hopefully have higher levels of enrollment in where we can get drugs approved quicker. Yeah, I think uh, we're all very concerned about it. We should all be aligned uh, in having more patients on trial, moving things faster and getting it done more cheaply. And uh, uh, I, I think we're making progress. It's not as fast as any of us want, but uh, we're, we're all trying to move, move the ball forward. Okay, so Mike, it comes excuse me, Jim, it comes down to us then as patients. We have to push, right? We have right. to see what's within ourselves, what are we willing to do, understand our clinical situation and what's going on for our cancer, and we gotta push, right? And one of the things we need to push for are more interesting trials. We need to make pharma companies put up their, their drug against another pharma company's drug. I think it's so, uh, troubling when they're afraid to take big steps. They just take little incremental steps with their trials. If we can put drug A of one company versus drug A of another company, uh, pharma companies are really reluctant to do those kinds of trials. And yet those are the kind that would be exciting to patients. I could give certain names of myeloma drugs, but we won't get into that. <laughs> it just needs that we need to get better, more interesting trials, and that will attract patients. Okay, so I want to just put in a plug for something. Uh, we started something at Patient Power called the Patient Power Ambassador Program. Uh, and you can see it listed on our site where you can share your voice. So we can all work with Jim, work with Dr. Thompson, and we can not just be getting what's right for us, but we can push on this process. So please consider doing that because I want to thank you, Jim O'Mell, for not just getting what's right for you as a myeloma patient, but working on these government panels and uh, with advocacy groups to try to advance it for all of us. Jim O'Mell, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to do this and I'll keep doing it. Yes, and uh, long life, Jim. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, Dr. Mike Thompson, thank you, Mike, for your leadership too and those extra hours you put in not just for programs like this, but all the clinical research, speaking to industry and the government to try to improve this process. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Mike Thompson. Well, thanks for having me on. And I think this is the, you know, some of the most powerful patient education material that people can get this type of uh, program. Right, thank you so much. So folks, we're all in this together. So you have your own issues about whether you know about trials, whether you wanna be in a trial, whether it's right for you or a loved one, whether it's, close to home, not close to home. So, but we have these discussions. So please look ongoing at the Clinical Trials Mythbusters series. Let us know how we did today. You can always write me, Andrew at patientpower.info, our producer, Tamara, T-A-M-A-R-A at patientpower.info, and talk to your own doctor and your own healthcare team about clinical trials and where they line up, what are the obstacles, for you participating. And let's see if we can improve this process and ultimately have more medicines that can lead to a cure for us be available sooner. Thank you for watching. We've done our best today, but this is an ongoing discussion. In Carlsbad, California, I'm Andrew Shore. Jim joined us from Nebraska. Dr. Mike Thompson joined us from Wisconsin. Worldwide, we're here for you. Remember, knowledge can be the best medicine of all. Thanks for joining us.